Good afternoon, everyone. We are back. Welcome to Rankable episode 19. I'm your host, Jared Thomas, Senior Account Executive at iPoolRank. And today we have special guests and our topic today is the importance of content strategy, right? So I have Paul Zaleski, who is VP of Marketing at Verblio, and I also have CEO Steve Pockross from Verblio. How are you both doing, gents? Doing great, thanks. Great, great, man. I'm, I'm super excited for this episode. As you guys know, who've been watching Rankable for all these episodes. I just love talking content. And for those who aren't familiar with Verblio, Verblio provides engaging, effective content to businesses and agencies across the US. And basically they have a system of superior writer to client matching that's helping set them apart from competitors and really help them and contributed to helping them get six consecutive Mercury 100 awards for fastest growing private company in Colorado. So that, that's amazing. And you guys are certainly content experts. And I would love to, you know, the main goals for this conversation is to showcase what's the importance of having a sound content strategy. How do you differentiate yourself from competitors and provide some tips and, and, and tricks and, you know, techniques for creating that sound strategy for everybody who's watching at home. So I'd love to start with you, Steve, to, you know, as the CEO, you know, what are some things from a big picture standpoint in terms of marketing? How, how are you guys incorporating content strategy into your own strategy to differentiate yourself from competitors and grow your business? Great. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having us. I think content yeah, strategy, for first, uh, uh, to introduce Paul and myself, uh, yeah. we've been working together for 15 years. Uh, we've worked at seven different companies together. We've been building wow. together for four years. Um, so uh, you will notice that uh, both of us jump in at various points without really paying attention to uh, to the other one uh, <laughs> telepathically. So excited to be here with Paul. Uh, Paul is much more the expert on the SEO strategy side on building our content strategy. Uh, so he'll be answering a lot more of those questions. What we're trying to really do, so our entire, so we inherited this company about four years ago from the founders who really got it off to a really great base. Uh, they've been look, working with kind of a concept that many people have been working on is like, how do you use marketplace uh, business models and technology and use of labor to provide a better content uh, competitive advantage uh, for agencies and other digital marketers? Totally. And so we decided four years ago to really focus on how do we reinvent this? It's time for the next evolution of this model to drive more value. And the reason that we did uh, focus so much on this is one is we have a deep background and having done this in another industry, which is why we so wanted to do it in content creation to be at the point of the sphere of modern marketing and uh, the most compelling marketing out there. And also one of the great gifts that our founder gave us. So our founding CEO was a journalist. And so he didn't have as much of a background in startups or, uh, um, or or scaling companies. But one thing he did do was he wrote a blog every single day for the first six years of the company wow. and gave us such amazing competitive advantage on SEO and search that we were bringing in a thousand new clients every single year without doing any marketing. And I brought wow. Paul on. We hadn't done as much SEO in our background together uh, to look at, you know, well, what should we do differently? No. No, nobody brings in an entire new team is like, you know, do exactly what we were doing before. That's going to keep, that's what we want to see you do. And we looked at it and we're like, wow, these guys really were onto something. This is one of the best gifts that a founding team could ever give you is a just ongoing stream of reliable, like an annuity stream of customers. And so wow. we went really big on our own content and in the same way that we want all of our clients to do too. Absolutely. That, that's amazing. You said six years one blog a day for six years, the consistency and the level of preparation, you know what I mean? Just to set yourself up, you, you built a solid foundation and something that intrigues me about you, Steve and the team, right? Is that you guys definitely get the content, right? Cause you guys are doing it yourself. We think very similar in terms of like, Hey, we have to stay top of mind to our customers and we have to, you know, engage with our audience. We have to create the podcast and, and give free information in order for them to come back to us as a potential client. Right? So that's, that's right. amazing. Right. Um, I'm curious what, what, what made you start the podcast too? Um, it was like, or is it like not really a writer thing? It's like, hey, I don't really want to do the blogs. Is, is it a way for you to engage with the potential prospects? Like, what was the goal there? So, uh, a couple of reasons. One is, you know, content has really changed over the last ten years since our since the founders built this company. And so, he was starting off his original blogs where it could be like two hundred words or less about what his shoes were going to be for that day, and wow. it helped us rank on on Google. <laughs> and and clearly, things have gotten a lot more competitive as more people have figured out this is the place to be. Uh, as one of your top marketing channels. And so we have slowly evolved, like, uh, you know, not slowly, We every single year we try to evolve our platform to meet where content is and where content's going to be most effective. So as an example, when we first took over this company, 
96% uh, of our blog posts were less than a thousand words. Four years later, it's two thirds of what we write is a thousand words or more. So wow. everything has gone long form and more interesting. Uh, getting to the getting to the podcast part, the next evolution is less fre or less frequency, more substance, and more uh, engage your clients of where they want to be at their own time frame. So I've always wanted to do a podcast. It's uh, much more of a natural medium for me. I was actually a journalist for a short period of my life, but writing is really hard and talking seems really easy to me. So Same. it works out better. Same. Yeah, I'm going to tell the team, too. I'm, they're expecting a blog from me this week. I got you guys. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard for me. <laughs> but I think that was that's super interesting, right? Because you guys, once again, right, you, you guys are understanding where the audience is, right, what they want and how they want to be engaged with. I think that's something that's really cool and something that you touched on, right? So and it is actually a poll question. So how do you guys create that content to differentiate your audience? There's so much competition now within every specific term or every you know topic and things like that. So how do you guys approach the content, right? To, you know, it's one thing to create a blog and you know articles and things like that, but what are some things to help you guys differentiate? Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, I, I think the the interesting thing about being in the digital marketing space or going after uh, keywords that are in the digital marketing universe is that we're competing with people like Moz and HubSpot, yeah. uh, search engine land. So, you know, okay. there's an amazing number of people that are creating content about how to create content and about SEO. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was kind of daunting coming in. You know, I, I don't want to go up head to head with HubSpot for their keywords. Uh, and so when we when we started to take a look at the business and what was happening, we did a, a few things. The first was, and Steve alluded to this, uh, the founding team did this amazing job of setting us up for success. Uh, we came in with, uh, when I started, we had a uh, almost a 50 domain authority. So we had this really strong foundation, yeah. um, but we needed to make some changes. The first one of those is that we decreased our publishing frequency. So we went from one blog a day to uh, about one a week uh, and really focused on uh, quality over quantity. Totally. And then the second thing was really try to look for our niche within digital marketing. It wasn't like, you know, how to, uh, how to, the basics of how to do SEO. People have written that to death. Exactly. Uh, but we, we wanted to find what our, our specific angle there was. And it was really about content creation, how to outsource content creation. Uh, and so within that digital marketing landscape, um, how could we find our niche was the first big thing. Yeah. The second thing that we looked at was, was the brand. And uh, brand is, is huge, uh, I think, when it comes to content and SEO. Uh, if, if you have a strong brand, it can be the difference between, you know, you're one of hundreds of blog posts saying the same thing uh, to, oh, you really have this strong voice that allows you to stand out from the crowd. So we rebranded the company uh, a little over two years ago now. We put a ton of time and effort into that. And we thought a lot about how do we just be different than our competitors? We didn't want to yeah. you know, just be another content this, content that. Uh, and how do we really stand out? And, and the, the thing that we settled on was bringing more of the company's personality forward. Um, so we're, we're a quirky group, <laughs> we're <laughs> weird sometimes, and we decided, you know what, it's okay if we were not, you know, the stodgy corporate uh, sounding brand, we wanted to sound real and sound authentic. So that's that was the second big, big change that we made. I, I, th I think that's crucial, right? I think, cause especially when we're thinking of content, sometimes we think of what's good for us and not necessarily what's good for the audience or, and things of that nature, right? And you have to have that brand voice and tone, right? I'm not gonna be HubSpot, I'm not gonna be Moz, right? And for us as I pull rank, we're not gonna be publicists in some of these big agencies, right? So some things that help us differentiate ourselves is being real and being authentic, right? Sometimes it's me, sometimes it might be me telling a story about things I've overcome in my past, right? It could be a SEO tip, it could be marketing, it could be anything, right? But how do you stay relatable and how do you stay top of mind to your audience? And I think, like you said, just figuring out what your voice is and then, you know, just figuring out where your audience is and just going for it is, is so crucial. And I'm curious, being that you guys had so much content in the past, right? What are your thoughts on repurposing or how often do you repurpose some of that older content into some new deliverables today or some new, you know, forms of content? Like how often do you go back and do like an audit? 
That's a great question, Jared. And, and first, I got to give you kudos. I think you do a phenomenal job of this on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, something you, to think about is that a brand can really be a collection of individual voices in a company. And this is something that I know you think a lot about is that, you know, you as Jarrett can be your own voice that's part of I Pull Rank. And similarly, we think about this with Steve and his voice on LinkedIn. Exactly. Um, so kudos there. Um, but to your Thank question you. on, on repurposing and auditing, we do a lot of this. Uh, and, and one of the first things that we did from the kind of closer to technical SEO standpoint uh, is content pruning. So we had a lot of really great content on the blog from blogging every day for seven years. Uh, we had some that was just not in the funnel. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, examples of this is that we still rank uh, number one on Google for uh, worst Halloween candy names. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's fun, and we get a giant spike in traffic every October, um, but there was a lot of stuff like that on the blog that just wasn't at all in our funnel. So the, the first thing we did is, is an audit and uh, we pruned out uh, hundreds of pages from the blog. Uh, and then part of that was also taking a look and figuring out what we could repurpose, what we could combine. Uh, I know this is something you guys think a lot about, Jared, uh, is you know, there, there were a lot of individual blog posts that were talking about related terms on the blog, and we did a lot of combining those into longer, more pillar style pages. Yep. Uh, and we have continued to do that. Uh, we refresh uh, at least our top 10 to 20 blog posts, hopefully about every six months, but at least once a year. Um, we just get astounding results over and over again from that strategy. Yeah. And have you, like, in terms of repurposing, have, have some of those articles, have you changed it to different formats? Like, what are your thoughts on, on interactives? I'm curious to hear from you both. Like, me personally, I, you know, me coming from Ion and, you know, Scribble Live, and I was selling that product. And just the benefit of having interactive content for those that are at home, right, as opposed to static, like, say, an article or blog post, I can read an article or a blog and get all the way to the end of it, finish it, like it. The problem is, us as marketers, we don't know what's important to you, right? And that's the, the big thing I have about it. So it's really hard to... You know, measure attribution and some of those other things, right? So the thing about interactives is that anytime they do anything on a, you know, they click on something, that feeds back into your CRM and you could tell a better story, especially for me on the sales side. I could say, Paul, man, I know you clicked on X, Y, Z. I thought this was really cool, man. Let's have a conversation. It kind of simplifies the sales process. So have you guys used some of that in your, in your, um, you know, in your own formats and your own strategy? And where do you guys see that going like in the future? What do you think the future of content is? It's an excellent question, and I think you know it's a challenge for a lot of marketers, especially sure marketers with smaller teams like we have. So yeah. we, think, we think a lot about it. We haven't done a ton of interactives, but what we do think is about how we can bring in elements that allow marketers on smaller teams to increase the level of their interactivity. So we acquired mm -hmm. a, a video creation company uh, about two years ago as well. Oh, cool. Uh, and they, uh, that company allows us to create really short form videos and embed video and written content. So it's got some machine learning software that'll take a piece of written content and create a storyboard video from it in about a minute. Uh, wow. So our, our goal there was to bring video to kind of the common marketer, the SMB marketer. Uh, video is one of those things that's incredibly intimidating and it can feel like, well, you know, if I can't fly in a production crew and spend <laughs> a video, I can't do it. Uh, and so we really wanted to figure out a way to bring video and video is such an important part of the future of content marketing um, really to create a way to turn written content into video so you can create a short teaser video to put on social media. Uh, you can embed a summary video into a piece of written content. Uh, and so video is one of those things that we've thought a lot about. We record our podcast in video yep. format so that we can repurpose it. We can cut up different clips, totally. um, combine clips. So it's like, all right, let's pull in five SEO experts that we've had on five different podcast episodes into one two-minute video. So I think video is probably our first big foray into interactives. but. Uh, it's uh, it's important. Uh, we're we're excited about what we can do with it in the future as well. 
Absolutely. And I think that's the big misconception, too, that you have to bring in this big production crew and all of these things. Right. I think the, the problem is just getting started, just getting started. Like when I first started on LinkedIn, I think, you know, too, Paul, me and you discussed this. Right. It was me and my you know partner on the sales team, Lee. We would just go downstairs, get a coffee and he would just throw a topic out. I throw a topic out. We would just pull it out on our phone. I kid you not. And then we did that for about two months straight. It went from two likes to 20. Then we're from 20 to 40. And then next thing you know, we're going to get a chicken parm or something. They're like, hey, that's Jared and Lee. And I'm like, oh my, we got something. Mike, we got something. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that, that's just what it is. Just don't overthink it, right? It doesn't have to be the production. You'll refine and optimize as you go. But the best thing is to stay top of mind. Just put it out there. And I think that's the end of the, the platform that you guys have in order to embed that into your written content. I think that's crucial. And I didn't know that. I'm definitely going to, Hit you on a side note about that. <laughs> and uh, I'm also curious, being that you guys work with, you know, a ton of agencies like ourselves, right? What are some things or some challenges you think that agencies are facing or, or what are some things that they are not approaching content? What are some things that can change to their, to their content strategy to help them improve? Yeah, Steve, you want to go first and then I'll, I'll tack on? No, because then you're going to give the right answer. I'm going to give the wrong one first. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll, I'll go first, and then Steve, Steve, back me up. So, <laughs> it's it's been a fascinating journey. You know, I've been doing digital marketing and SEO for ten years, uh, and uh, it's it's been fascinating for me running marketing for Verblio because uh, we get to we get access to all of these digital agencies like you guys. We are working with four hundred plus digital agencies in any given month. Wow. And it's it's really fun to talk to all these folks and just get all of these cutting edge strategies, understand what agencies are doing. Mm -hmm. I think another thing that was unexpected for me is just how hard it can be for agencies to create content. Um, cool. And uh, you know, you, you think of agencies as the expert marketers, and they often are, but agencies also have serious constraints from a budget perspective, from a people perspective, from a time perspective. Yeah. Uh, and so I think one of our big learnings uh, about working with agencies and what agencies do well or don't do well uh, is creating content strategies that allow their clients to get results on reasonable budgets. Yeah. You know, it, it's easy to talk about the theory of 10x content and interactive content. And, you know, if you're serving Fortune 500 companies who can spend 20 grand on a piece of content, then, you know, the, that playbook has been written. But I think the playbook of uh, digital agencies serving SMBs is the harder challenge to solve. So Absolutely. if you look at agencies who are doing this well, uh, they're doing a few things. One is... They're not expecting their clients to create their own content. That's a recipe for failure and a recipe for waiting around for uh, your clients forever. So they're building that level of trust that allows them to uh, hit publish, you know, with just a quick thumbs up from their client, or just they've got uh, their client's approval to hit publish on their own. Um, thing number two is that they're publishing regularly, but they're not starting with this insane plan of. You know, I'm going to produce hundreds of pages a month for you. They're starting uh, reasonably. Uh, another thing that I think is fascinating is that, you know, there, there's all of these new fangled content types and all of these things, but the, the good old blog post still produces it works. amazing it works. results, uh, especially if it's long form comprehensive stuff. Uh, and so that's something that, you know, we see agencies who don't get distracted by the shiny lights of, of all of this stuff and just produce regular content for their clients doing this extremely well as well. Totally. I, I think you nailed, you nailed every point on that, right? And I, I could definitely speak for us IPR, like we're creating about two blogs per week, right? It's a must. We have to have the blog once a week, I mean, two times a week. And then we also on top of post on LinkedIn and other things we do, we do webinars. And then we also have the podcast like today. So it's just like, how do you stay top of mind? And like for the SMBs, it's harder. I think there's a, the perception is right. That you have to spend this amount to get 10 X content. Right. When really that's not really the case. Right. It's really just, how do you differentiate yourself and what can you do that separate yourself from the pack? Right. What kind of value can you provide? And I think you guys do a great job with that. And I think that you really need to, if you're not in content right now, 
what's selling for you when you're not selling? I think that's the biggest thing that people need to think about is brands, SMBs, right? How, who's going to be your seller when, when Jared's off, when, you know, this one is off and these types of things, right? And that's what it is. And quality content is going to do that for you, right? And you just have to build that brand voice, you know, build that tribe, so to speak. And then just know the intent, right? I know if you from an SEO standpoint, right? Know the intent from the keywords, mapping out your audience and things like that, and then delivering that content. I think a lot of places where, I think another place where a lot of agencies and I think just brands in general fail is the distribution of that content. I think sometimes they just let it go on the website and then it's just like, all right, it lives and dies on the website, right? So I'm curious to know from you guys, like what are some, you know, how do you guys distribute? You've got that great piece of content, you know it's gonna fly. You know, what are some channels you're using and how do you distribute it? Yeah, and, and I will say that distribution, uh, I, I would classify as having been one of our weaknesses for uh, a long time. Uh, our, entire, our entire marketing team, myself included, is pretty introverted. So it's so tempting to just hit publish and then just hope that stuff happens. Totally. Uh, <laughs> Steve had uh, Ross Simmons on our podcast uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, shout out to Ross, great dude. Yeah, he gave a great, great talk about the importance of distribution. So it's, uh, it's one of our perennial goals to get better at. Uh, we, are, we are fortunate enough to have a strong enough domain authority that we can just hit publish sometimes and kind of cheat the system a little bit. Um, but I think we've been getting a lot better, particularly with the podcast and putting a lot of effort into Steve's LinkedIn, that hey, we have this distribution channel uh, in LinkedIn, in the podcast, where we can promote other pieces of our content. Uh, and then I think another shift for us has been thinking about this idea that not every piece of content that we focus on for distribution has to have an SEO uh, goal or SEO mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've given ourselves permission to create content just for fun or just for branding sake. A yeah. um, couple of uh, good examples of this is uh, last year, uh, we realized that half of our team was going to HubSpot's inbound event and about a third of our team was going to Burning Man at the exact same time. And so we did this compare and contrast blog post about the differences between inbound and Burning Man. Uh, this year, since we're a words company, we did a COVID dictionary where we cool. created terms that we thought should exist because everyone's now working from home and the challenges of all of this. Uh, and that did super well. Uh, Steve did a post a couple of weeks ago about a notice he got from uh, the Brazilian phone company that he was when he was living in Brazil. And that I think is our best performing LinkedIn post ever. So <laughs> that mission to just have more fun with it and realize that there can be, uh, that it can be easier to promote stuff that's just purely fun and brand has been a big realization for us. Absolutely, and, and what, what, is, what are some of the results have you guys seen from the LinkedIn? Now, now I, I could definitely tell you mine. I think that's, you hit the head on, you hit, hit the nail on the head with it, right? You have to be relatable. You know, sometimes it's the stories that necessarily people don't want to hear right my best performing post was me on a jet ski with my 11 my 12 year old son right like we was, it was his birthday we couldn't go to virginia beach the line was crazy it was covid i'm like i'm not going over there <laughs> like, like well, let's try it when we get back home and then i put the story up on linkedin and it's like me and him on the hudson by the statue of liberty on a jet ski and it's got like three four hundred likes and i'm like I would have never done that before, right? But those are the conversations and those are the pieces of content that make that personal connection, right? And if you can break down that sales barrier and just be seen as a person, as a brand, and you know, you're gonna go and check what we have out, right? And what we've seen internally is that LinkedIn and social media has been a, a huge driver of traffic to our website and, and through those things, right? So you would never think that, hey, me on a jet ski may help the brand in total, but it's like, you know, people see that, they connect with it. It's relatable, it's real, it's authentic, and people go back, and that's who you want to work with. I don't want the, the cookie cutter content. I don't want the, the same, more of the same, and I don't want the thought leader guy. Like, I, I have some good not marketing knowledge, but I'm not a thought leader. I'm just a guy who does sales every day, and I know what customers are saying. I know what people, that, the challenges are, so I can speak to those. You know what I mean? So I just, just be real, be realist, be authentic. You know, be real, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. Just have fun. People take the fun out of content. It should be fun, <laughs> you know, laugh, do something, you know, show people your personality. I did one thing where I was just on stories. I was just listening to music, just dancing. And, and I got like 10 DMs like, yo, man, you're a vibe, man. I love you. And I'm like, 
<laughs> I, I didn't even think about it. I'm just sitting there doing my thing. <laughs> like, and that's just what happened. So I, I'm definitely glad that you brought that point up, man. Like just have fun and you know stay top of mind. So, and I was gonna ask you another as we as we come up to the and time flies when you're having fun, man. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> but um what I'm curious, you know, from you guys, like what are some interesting examples of, you know, or what are what are some brands that you think are really doing it well with content strategy? Or what are what are some things like say if you're an SMB, you don't have a, a ton of budget, right? How should you be, you know, approaching it, right? If you have limited bandwidth, you only have one content writer. You know, should you be focused on the big evergreen piece or should we be doing things like we're saying just now, like showing more brand personality and, and things like that? What do you think we should do there? It's, it's a good question. I think for SMBs, it's it's great to take a look at low hanging fruit first, um, because often, you know, if you can figure out what your niche, whether you're your hyper niche from an industry perspective or whether you're a local business, you can likely find low-hanging SEO fruit, and totally. uh, that that is where to start, in my opinion. Uh, is you know what are those ten or twenty blog posts that are going to get you some results that are start going to start building your backlog of content, uh, start creating that foundation. Um, so that, that's thing number one, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. I think having fun with it, and then the other big thing that I think people miss so often is just this idea that content only needs to serve Google or serve SEO. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, brands, brands that think like that, especially SMBs uh, who think like that are gonna quit because uh, they're not gonna see results fast enough. It's, it's a big investment, it's a long-term investment. So, uh, yeah. If you can think about creating content that's gonna help your sales team, help your sales team, you know, your sales team can send that out after they talk to someone and it's gonna provide value to a prospect who came in through a different channel, uh, yeah. content that you know is going to make your website look alive. You don't want people coming to your website and seeing that the last blog post was nine months ago. Um, so thinking about content in a way that is going to serve multiple uh, goals for your business is going to keep you doing it over the long haul. Totally, and I would even I would even add to that. Right, if you're an SMB you know your customer better than anybody, right? So what are the questions that you're getting actively on the phone, right? What are you hearing from them? And proactively create content to answer those to simplify the sales process, right? You know what they're looking for. You know, every obviously every opportunity is different, but answer those questions. It doesn't necessarily have to have the search volume of, you know, 10,000 or 15,000, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's that one person who's actively looking for your services that needs to know that answer and you provide that, your sales or your your chances exponentially increase to get that sale, right? Or at least build that relationship. So if I was an SMB right now, you know, just create content around your customers, what they want to hear, what problems you need to solve, and what do you help solve. Have some fun with it. Show your brand personality, the culture, things like that, and just go on LinkedIn right now because obviously the the reach is far you know better than any other social media channel right now, and that's that can change in the blink of an eye. So while the getting is good. Get on LinkedIn, you know, get out there, post every day, stay consistent, whether it's a motivational quote, whether it's something funny, just go for it, right? And, and, and you know, as I probably Mike's on Kimmy for this, even as an SEO guy, right? Like Google changes, it changes rapidly, right? So if you've put all your eggs in one basket in terms of Google, they change it tomorrow. Like, say, for instance, they do the mobile first thing now. If you don't have mobile first optimal pages, now you're not going to be indexed. And it's like, what uh, I just did all this stuff for desktop. Now, what do you do? <laughs> you, you all those resources gone. So just stay nimble, you know, create on the fly and just know your audience and, and just try to meet them where they want to be or where they're going to be. Well said, sir. I, I appreciate it, man. And, and it's two o'clock already, man. I just want to say thank you both. I don't want to keep you keep you longer, guys. But Steve, Paul, thank you so much for joining. I, I had fun on this conversation. You know, I'm sure we're going to be in touch afterwards. I would love to come on you guys' shows if they have an opportunity. And, um, you know, for season two, I'm definitely going to have you guys back on. So <laughs> but thank you so much, man. Can't thank you guys enough. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us. Appreciate it. And for those watching at home, thank you for, for still joining. Thank you for the continued support. I can't believe we're on episode 19, um, all because of you guys' support. And thank you so much. You know, we'll be back next week. Uh, I don't know. I know we've got some good guests coming up. We've got um, Heather, who is CMO of HFC. It's going to be a really good one. And then we also have, for the sports people, we have the Big 12 Director of Marketing. Will Gully is going to be here. We're going to talk about how they're monetizing with sports right now with college coming back. So 
it's going to be a good conversation. So I appreciate you, gents. Thank you for everybody at home. And I hope you have a great rest of the week, guys. We'll see you soon. Talk soon. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.